Hello, I'm Jonathan Harder. I work for ZOS Comm Server Organization uh, in VTAM. I've been working in VTAM for the past 22 years uh, in various incantations. I've done design, development, test, and um, a change team and level 2 support also. Um, I'm going to be presenting a series of ABPN topics um, for everyone to use as educational material. The topic that I'll be discussing today is ABPN log modes and class of service. The way I always start this presentation out is by the disclaimer, don't shoot the messenger, right? I always try to explain to customers that when people see this presentation, they wonder what was going through your head when you invented an architecture like this. And I have to remind them as well as myself that the ABPN architecture was not done by VTAM. It was done by the System 36, System 38 group as a way to start sessions, LU62 sessions, without the assistance from VTAM. So because of that, they invented an architecture that worked for them. Now, once VTAM decided we were going to play in the APPN game, we had to play by the rules that were already set in place, and some of those were the log mode and class of service rules. At the same time, VTAM has always done subarea log mode and class of service the way we've always done it in the subarea realm. So when we stuck these two together at the interchange node, the interchange node had to make sure that he was playing by the APPN rules in the APPN side of the network and the subarea rules in the subarea side of the network. And it's us gluing those two architectures that already existed together that basically introduced a lot of these problems. So when, you start, when your head starts spinning as you see this presentation, just remember, it's because the architectures were done at different times by different groups without really talking to each other. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about log modes and class of service. The first thing we have to figure out, the primary way of resolving a log mode name to a class of service is by looking it up in a log mode table. You look up the log mode name in the log mode table, and it's got the cost equals operand on it that tells you what subarray cost is going to be used, and it's got the APPN cost operand on it now that allows you to tell what APPN class of service should be used for that log mode name. So the first question is, is which log mode table do we use? And we basically, VTM did this the same way, it's always done this in every release of VTM. The log mode table that is associated with the secondary LU of the session is always the log mode table that we use to look up log mode names. All right? The way you code that is you can use the, the mode tab start option, excuse me, not the mode tab operand on the SLU definition, like the LU or the Apple or even a CDRC definition. We also gave you a dyne mode tab start option so that dynamically created CDRCs could inherit a table other than the default log mode table which we'll talk about in a little while also. In fact, we'll talk about it now. The IBM default log mode table is called IST INCLM. We ship that with every release of ETAM. We know it exists. So if we can't find a log mode table associated with the secondary LU, we haven't specified one, or it's a dynamic a CRC and you don't have this start option coded, then the bottom line is we always use IBM's default log mode table. All right? Which log mode table entry in that table do we actually use? Well, if the originating LU provides us with a log mode name, we look that log mode name up inside the SLU's log mode table, and if we find it, that's the log mode entry we use. If we don't find it, we will always look up the log mode name inside the IBM default table afterwards. I think we go into that a little bit more, but I'll at least mention it right now. So one example might be somebody does a log on Apple ID kicks and mode name interactive. That's the OLU providing a log mode name, for example. Right? Now, if the OLU does not provide a log mode name, then basically when the request makes it to a certain host, we have to choose a default log mode name. And we can choose a default log mode name for each secondary LU. The way you specify the default log mode name for a secondary LU is by coding the D log mode operand on the SLU definition statement. Right? If you don't code the D, uh, this would be on an Apple or an, LU, uh, App, Apple or an LU definition, you could also code it on a CDRC if you wanted to. We also gave you a start option, DynD log mode, which is used for dynamic CDRCs, so that they don't have to inherit the same default log mode entry. Um, or or the, uh, the first one inside ISTI and CLM would, be, would typically be the case, but we'll get into that a little bit more later also. So the bottom line is, if you wanted to, you could specify a start option that says every dynamic CDRC uses this default log mode. This is of marginal use, actually, because in most cases, you can't use the same log mode name for every dynamically created CDRC. So typically, you'll have to predefine some CDRCs and code the D log mode on there if you want to make those things work well. All right? If we can't find the log mode name, in, if we can't find the uh, D log mode associated with the secondary LU, then the first log mode entry inside the SLU's log mode table is considered the default log mode. So if we look up our SLU RDTE and it does not have D log mode code on it and it wasn't a dynamic CDRC so there's no dynamic mode tab, then basically we will look up the SLU's log mode table and use the very first log mode entry inside his table. And if the SLU doesn't even have a log mode table associated with it, 
we'll use the first entry inside IST, uh, IST INC allowing the default log mode table. So we've gone through most of this before, but I'll go through it again. This is the actual process of looking up a log mode name. First, we look for the specified session log mode name if we got it. We look it up in the SLU's log mode table first. And if we can't find it there, we'll look it up in the IBM default log mode table, IST INC allowed. If we don't find it in there, and this is the log mode that was specified for the D log mode. If we can't find either of them inside these tables, then we actually search for another log mode entry called IST COSDF, which is basically the default log mode name. It provides the default class of service entries, if you will. So we will actually search the SLU's log mode table for IST COSDF log mode entry. And if it's not in the SLU's log mode table, we'll actually search the IBM default log mode table for that IST COSDF entry. And oh, by the way, we shipped IST, the IST INCLM table, and we know it's got IST COSDF in there. So unless you forgot to compile it, or unless you deleted it out before you compiled it, we know we'll actually find it in there. Now, the IST COSDF entry is actually an LU62 log mode entry. It's a bind image that looks like LU62. So you may not want to use the default log mode entry, IST COSDF, for all types of LUs. And that's why we only do the second step if there's, a, there's an IST COSDF start option that basically indicates what types of LUs are allowed to use the uh, default class, the default log mode entry. And you can specify that. I think I've got another turn on that later, so I'll hold off on it for now. All right, so now let's talk about a little bit of an overview of how subarray networks and how APPN networks do log mode and class of service resolution. We'll start out with the subarray network, which is in blue again. Log mode name is chosen by the originating LU. But if, it's, if a blank log mode is provided by the originating LU, then we basically use the default log mode name, and that default log mode name is always chosen by the SSCP that owns the secondary LU. All right, so there were provisions in there for a primary LU starting a session and not providing a log mode name. Basically, we'd send the request over to the SLU owning host, the SLU owning host would accept the connection and also provide what the, log, the default log mode would be. Now, the summary class of service name is always chosen by the secondary LU, all, the SSCP that owns the secondary LU also. And that's because when we're at the primary LU host, we don't always have a log mode name. But if we don't have a log mode name at the primary LU host, by the time we get to the secondary LU host, he has picked the default log mode name. And now that we've got the default log mode name, he can also pick the summary class of service. As the request or reply flows from the secondary LU to the primary LU, that summary class of service name is actually translated at every SNI boundary to a corresponding class of service in each attached SNI network. Then after you select the class of service, the route that is chosen through the network is always chosen by the SSCP of the PLU on the PLU side of the summary network or by the gateway SSCP on the PLU side of the network. They're the ones who activate the virtual route and the explicit routes that you need to be able to actually send the data across those routes. So we pick the virtual route at the PLU side of the network and then we also activate that route from the PLU side of the network. In APPN networks, it works a little bit differently. The log mode name was always chosen by the originating LU. And remember, when APPN was first invented, every session was LU62, and so every session was PLU initiated. So you could read this as, in an APPN network, the log mode name was always chosen by the OLU equals PLU, right? There were no special provisions made for blanks whatsoever, all right? The APPN class of service name, therefore, can also be chosen at the PLU side of the network, because we always knew the class of service by then. So in this case, the APPN class of service would be, uh, would be chosen by the originating LU of the primary LU or the secondary LU, excuse me, or, or his network node server. I think the architecture says that if the end node doesn't pick a log mode name, the network node server can choose it for him, right? And again, APPN class of service names can be mapped at APPN network boundaries in much the same way as translating the SNI boundaries from, um, on the way from the OLU to the DLU. All right, the RCD is always computed by the PLU side of the network, which is comparable to the virtual route being picked by the PLU side of the network. So we compute the route by the PLU side of the network in each of the APPN networks. There are some exceptions when there are interchange TGs involved, which I'm not going to go into right now. So we had to decide at the time we did this whether we were going to always use the primary LU side to pick the log mode name and calculate the route and the class of service, or whether we were always going to choose the OLU side. And what we noticed was that if you sent an APPN locate search through an APPN network, some intermediate base APPN nodes who didn't support SSE, some of them would detect the fact that there was a missing log mode or class of service name, and they could reject it. So the bottom line was when we extended this architecture to support SLU in it, we still had to make sure that the log mode name was being chosen by the originating LU, which in this case now is the secondary LU. 